turn to Exodus chapter 2. Uh, as I mentioned last week, Moses' life can be divided up into three 40-year segments. His first 40 years, he lived in royalty as he was uh, miraculously adopted by the princess of Pharaoh, Pharaoh's daughter. And he became a prince in Egypt. You know, for the first 40 years, he had it made. He had the best education, uh, the best instruction possible for the world. And so... We saw last time he saw a Hebrew man who was being bullied by a Egyptian, and so he came to his Hebrew brother's aid because he always knew he was Hebrew, growing up even. And so he strikes the Egyptian, kills the Egyptian, he buries the Egyptian man in the sand, and so he's thinking, I'm going to be the deliverer of the Israelites one at a time. I don't know how that's going to work. But he then the next day, it says he sees two Hebrews fighting against each other. And one of the Hebrews is beating up the other Hebrew. And so he comes to the other guy's defense. And then the guy tells him, are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian yesterday? And then it says Moses was fearful he, you know, realized, wow, Pharaoh knows this. I'm in trouble. And it tells us the next verse, Pharaoh, when he knew these things, wanted to kill Moses. So Moses flees, and then he goes to Midian, which is present-day Saudi Arabia. He's there for the next 40 years of his life. He, he marries a gal named Zipporah, who is the daughter of Jethro, his father-in-law. And for 40 years, he would be helping his father-in-law with his sheep. We saw that he was content uh, being out there in the wilderness, first time probably that he's been content in his life, but now 40 years later, still with the sheep. I don't know how content he still was, but he was content. He has two kids by Zipporah. The first son is Gershom. We saw his name mean stranger in a foreign land. Uh, we'll be introduced to Eliezer later on. His name means God is my help. But it's during this 40 years in the wilderness of Midian that God would prepare his heart for one of the greatest feats this world has ever seen, and that's leading about 3 million Jews out of Egypt into the wilderness where God would provide for them for 40 years. But now we're looking at the final 40-year segment uh, of his life. This is when it begins. He's now 80 years old. In these final 40 years, he'll be used by God to be the deliverer of the Israelites. But he's been marinating out in the wilderness for 40 years, and he's done, and God is going to call him. But it's many times we see throughout the scriptures is when you're in that place of isolation or desolation that God will bring great revelation into your life. We saw that with Elijah when he was fleeing from Queen Jezebel. He had just been used to slaughter the 450 prophets of Baal. They were false prophets. And so then he flees because Jezebel says, I'm going to get you. So he runs and he finds himself in this cave on a mountaintop. And it says God shows up and it says there was a mighty wind and it split the rocks. But it says God was not in the wind. Then this mighty earthquake shook the, shook the mountain, but God was not in the earthquake. And then it was a fire that passed through, but God was not in the fire. And then it says, in a still, small voice, that's how God spoke to Elijah. And that's how he'll speak to all of us if we're open to hear from him. When King David, long before he was king, he was anointed king when he was still the youngest son of Jesse, a shepherd out in the field watching over his father's flock. The Lord called him then. We saw the apostle Paul before he was Paul the Apostle, he was Saul of Tarsus, he gets saved, but then it says he went out into the wilderness for three years in Arabia, and it was there that the Lord spoke to him, the Lord taught him, the Lord you know, ministered to him as he studied the Word of God. And what did we just spend the last six months doing going through the book of Revelation? That was the Apostle John. He's in his mid-90s. He thought his life was pretty much over, and God says, no, it's not. I got another revelation for you, but... You're going to go into isolation. He's on the desolate island of Patmos, 
And it's there that he gets this tremendous revelation from the Lord himself. And it was in that place where he, you know, sees Jesus, you know, chapter one. He hears all about the church ages, chapters two and three. He, he hears about the, the great tribulation, chapters six through 18. He gets to witness the second coming of Christ, the millennial reign of Christ, the future home of glory that we're all going to be in after the millennial reign of Christ, the new heavenly home of new Jerusalem. Again, sometimes God has to bring us to the end of ourselves or bring us to that place of isolation and desolation in order for us to receive his glorious revelation. Now, we'll see this happen in the life of Moses personally, but at the same time, we'll see this happening with the, the Israelites collectively. In other words, God is working behind the scenes in Egypt that will prepare the hearts of the Jews to say, enough is enough, I want to get out of here. And maybe some of you are saying, enough is enough. I want to get out of here. I want to get out of this world. So it's in chapter 2, verse 23. This is where the final 40 years of Moses' life begin. So we pick up chapter 2, 23. Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage and... They cried out, and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. There's a lot going on in these few verses here. First of all, it says, in the process of time, the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh, dies. And once again, to the best of my ability of trying to track this down, it was uh, Thutmose II who dies, uh, his father Thutmose I, they really started putting the screws to the Jews, so to speak. They're really putting heavy-duty pressure on them. But now he dies, Thutmose II, and he's replaced by a worse king, the pharaoh known as Amenhotep, and, and he's the one that will really make things difficult uh, and harsh for the Jewish people. We also see in verse 23, God would use this evil pharaoh to cause the Jews to groan and cry out. In fact, as we look at this time frame in world history, we see that God is bringing three things together all at once. And as I mentioned last week, when we talked about the providence of God, He is sovereign, He is in control, and we see that the Jewish people are at their breaking point. That's the first thing we see taking place. Secondly, God is now you know, ready to use Moses after he's been out there in the wilderness for 40 years. But the third thing God is doing is preparing the land of promise. 400 plus years earlier, he told Abraham that he's going to bring him into the promised land. And he gave this covenant, as it says here, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God's got to prepare the land, but one of the things he has to do to prepare it is to remove all the pagan wicked people that were in the land. So look at these verses. It's in Genesis 15, starting in verse 13. This is when God establishes his unconditional covenant with Abraham. God says, Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. So that 400 years is about to be up. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. And we'll see that with the ten plagues that God brings against Egypt. Afterward, they will come out with great possessions. You know, the Egyptians will be giving, you know, the, the Jews tremendous wealth, jewels and gold and silver when they, when they flee during the Exodus. Now, as for you, talking to Abraham, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age, but in the fourth generation they shall return here. And here it is. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. In other words, God was not only using Egypt as an incubator for the Jews to go from 75 people to 3 million people, but God would use those 400 years to deal with the sins of of the Amorites. And the Amorites, it's kind of a generic term for all the different ites that were in 
the, the land uh, of promise, God's land. You had the Canaanites, the Jebusites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Parasites, and, and the Termites, and all, all the other ones. So they're occupying God's land. It's, it, it cracks me up when people say, oh, the Jews are occupying this land in Israel today. No, this is God's land. He promised it to the Jews. It's always been his land. He let these people occupy it for over 400 years, and he gave them 400 years to repent. You know, people think, wow, God's going to tell them to destroy all these people in the promised land. But think of it this way. God gave them 400 years to get right with God, but their hearts just got harder and harder and harder. When you look at the history of some of these people that were living in the promised land, they were more wicked, more corrupt, more immoral than you could imagine. They did horrible things. They would put their children, their firstborn son, alive. They would put him in a wall, seal up the wall as he's alive, and let him die in that wall, sacrificing to Molech. I mean, it was brutal, the things they did. We've perfected it through abortion horribly. But God knew their sins were ripe for judgment, and God did not want their sins rubbing off on the Israelites when they come into the promised land. And so that's why he would say you need to go in there and remove them, slaughter them, get them out, because it is like a rabid dog. If you have a dog with rabies, you put it down. You don't let the dog run around and bite your kids or other neighbors because it'll just infect others. And that's really how these people were, like a rabid dog. So God in his mercy will have them put down to protect the chosen people, the Israelites. At this moment in history, God is bringing all these things together. But here we see the Jews crying out again in verse 24, God heard their groaning. The people groan because of their bondage, and God hears their groanings. Now, in the Hebrew language, it's a physical groaning. They're not groaning spiritually to the Lord. They're just groaning physically in pain and suffering. And there's a difference. They're not crying out to God at this point, but God still hears their cry. He still hears their groaning because of their sufferings. The, the point is God is always the initiator. Always. We are the responders. We don't tell God what to do and how to do it. God tells us what to do and how to do it. We didn't initiate salvation. God initiated salvation. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. It says, in this, is, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, the satisfaction of God's wrath for us. 1 John 4, 19 says, we love him because he first loved us. He's always the initiator. We are to be the responders. God's work of salvation it always begins with God. And here with the Jewish people, God allowed the suffering to increase in order for them to see their need and that they would cry out and he would be there to deliver them. But the key to verse 24 is this. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. When you see that word remembered, it's always connected in the Hebrew with his covenant or his promise. He remembered his promise to them through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What was his promise? That he was going to bring them into the promised land. That he would go before them. He would prepare the land flowing with milk and honey and so forth. So it's not because these Jews deserve to be helped it's not because we deserve to be helped by the Lord, but it's because God has made a promise to the Jews, and he keeps his promise. God has made a promise to you, the new covenant under Jesus Christ, and so he will faithfully fulfill his promise to us, which is when we die, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. When we die, we're going to be in his presence forever. At the rapture, he's coming for his bride. He's given us these promises. The only thing these Israelites had going for them was God's covenant, his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When you look at their lives, and we'll see this play out very quickly, were they faithful to the Lord? No. Were they faithful to keep God's word? No. Were they faithful to obey the voice of the Lord? No. 
But God always keeps his promises. Again, verse 25 says, and God acknowledged them. It literally means, and God knew. In other words, God knew everything he's done for them, and he also knows everything he's going to do for them. And the same is true for you and I. This has everything to do with God's faithfulness, his love, but above everything, it has everything to do with his amazing grace. In other words, we don't deserve to be saved any more than the Israelites deserved to be set free from their bondage. But God allows people to come to the end of themselves with the hope that they'll see their need for salvation. I know how uh, many of you, that's how you got saved. You got to the end of yourself. I remember sitting in my car before I got saved. I was a junior at San Diego State, just crying out. And I, and I even said, God, if you're real, do something. I mean, I didn't know the Lord at all, but he just brought me to the end of what I thought was my life, and then God was there. He didn't respond to me, but he was waiting for me to cry out to him. God always allows us to go through things to draw us closer to him. I mean, Romans 3, 23 and 24 sums it up like this. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely. That word freely literally means without a cause. So we're justified freely, without a cause, by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. In other words, why did God love us? Because God is love. That, that simple. Not because he saw something in us and said, oh, they're so cute and cuddly, I just got to save them. No, we were sinful creatures. We were in rebellion against God. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. If God saved us for any reason, for anything we've done, then it's not grace then it's because he's giving us something we deserve. But Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 is very clear. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And so with God, it's always about grace, undeserved favor. And I bring that up because the book of Exodus is where we have the law introduced to us. When we get to chapter 20, that's when God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. And so I believe in dispensations, but not hardcore dispensations, because you see grace, even way back before the age of law, you had Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And that's when God judged the world with the flood. And then you have grace here with the Jewish people, even though it's the age of the law. We have the law still prevalent today. The Apostle Paul says in the age of grace we're in, the law is good if you use it lawfully. The law is not given to justify ourselves before God. The law is given to show us we don't measure up. Only Jesus fulfilled every jot and tittle of the law perfectly. The Ten Commandments, that's God's standard of perfection. In other words, if you could keep the Ten Commandments perfectly for your whole life, you'll go to heaven. Guess what? Nobody can and nobody has except for Jesus. He fulfilled it. And so now when we come to Christ by faith, he comes into our lives. The law has been fulfilled in us. So the law is still good because we tell people, you've broken these laws. You're a sinner. You need the Savior, Jesus. And so the law does its job by showing us that we fall short. But here's Jesus, the one who loves us, the one who died for us, the one who paid the price we could never pay. And so keep that in mind as we now come into chapter 3. Look at verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. Again, this is 40 years tending Jethro's sheep, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. So again, he's 80 years old at this point. You might think, well, I'm not quite 80 yet, but I can't see how God's going to use me. Are you kidding? He doesn't even start using Moses until he's 80. If you can still fog a mirror, God can use you. Don't ever think I'm too old, I've done too many things, God can never use somebody like me. I mean, you can come up with all these excuses, and we'll actually look at Moses' excuses next time, because I've used the same excuses. I can't talk very well. 
I stutter, I do this and that, and God will just like, you know what, it's not about you, Moses. It's about me working in you and through you. But the point here is you're never too old to be used by the Lord. But here's another important point here. It took Moses 40 years. He's in Egypt for 40 years. He's in the wilderness for 40 years. You might say it took God 40 years to get Egypt out of Moses. First he takes Moses out of Egypt, then he's got to get Egypt, the world, out of Moses. He does the same thing with you and me. We're in this world. He saves us out of this world. He disciples us. He strengthens us so that we can now go back into the world and be used by the Lord to deliver captives and set them free through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that's always the pattern. You're saved, you get out of the world, and then you're strengthened, you're encouraged by the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. You go back to the world, not go into the world, but back to the world to set captives free. And that's what he does here with Moses. One of the theme verses that Emily always brings up, and this is one of the things we see with the church planters, is 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2, where Paul says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And here it is. And the things which you have heard from me, so Paul tells Timothy, things you've heard from me, so Paul to Timothy, among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men. So Timothy, now you're talking to the third generation who will be able to teach others, the fourth generation also. So that's the pattern. God will use you to minister, disciple, encourage someone, some people, that they might minister, encourage, and disciple others, and it just keeps on going down the line. We see this over and over again with our church planters in India. It's glorious. So look at verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Anytime you see that title, the angel of the Lord, it's a reference to Jesus. It's a Christophany or an appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament. Now, we've brought this up many times as we've gone through the Bible. Um, I believe it was Jesus, it says, who walked in the cool of the evening in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. You know, when we look at uh, Genesis 18, there's three men, it says, came to Abraham in Sarah's tent. And we know two of them are angels because he says, we're going to cook a meal for you. So they prepare a meal for these three people. Two are angels. They go down to Sodom and Gomorrah. The third one that stays there, that's Jesus, because he even recognized this is the Lord, and he starts to negotiate with the Lord. Lord, what if there's 50 righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah? Are you going to destroy the, wick of the righteous with the wicked? God says, no, not for 50. What about 45? No, not for 45. What about 40? It's like an auctioneer. What about 30? 35? You know, 20, 20. You know, I mean, he goes down. What if there's 10? Not even for 10. Well, there wasn't even five. It was Lot, his two daughters, and then his pillar of salt wife. She wasn't salt of the earth. She became salt in the earth. I don't know. She didn't make it. So be that as it may, that was the Lord who was talking with Abraham. In Genesis 32, we see the angel of the Lord wrestling with Jacob all night long. And then eventually he pops out his hip, and Jacob recognizes that was the Lord. He calls the place Peniel, or the face of God. I've seen the Lord's face and I have been, my life has been preserved. So anytime the Lord appears in a physical form in the Old Testament is Jesus. God is spirit. The Father doesn't appear in physical form, but Jesus does. So in this verse, the Lord appears to Moses in a flame of fire in the midst of a bush, literally in the Hebrew means a thorny bush, uh, some say it could be like an acacia bush or an acacia tree. They can actually turn into trees. They're pretty good size, some of them. But a burning bush. Um, it wasn't that unusual to see a burning bush in the middle of the desert because sometimes shepherds on a cold, chilly night in the desert would set these on fire. A lot of oil in them, and they would burn. They'd keep them warm at night. Sometimes lightning would strike some of these bushes, and they would burn. But what happened? They would turn into ashes. So Moses sees this bush burning, and he's probably thinking, wow, that's interesting. And then he's like, 
well, this thing's not burning up. Well, this is kind of weird. It, it just keeps burning and burning and burning. Now, this is actually an, a, a wonderful picture of an on-fire follower of Christ. We should be burning brightly for Jesus, but because we have the Holy Spirit within us, we don't burn out. I mean, I've known a lot of pastors who've burned out over the years, but most of the time it's because they get so ministry-minded they lose track of the Lord. They don't put Jesus first and foremost. But we need to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit so we don't burn out. This is the meaning behind Zechariah 4, verse 6. This is when Zechariah sees the vision of the two olive trees supplying oil directly. It's like an automated system to keep the menorah burning brightly without anybody having to refill it. It just kept coming out of these trees. And so this is how it's described to Zechariah. So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. He was the one trying to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. In other words, the only way we as Christians can continue to burn brightly for Jesus and not burn out is to continually be filled and refilled with the Holy Spirit. It's not just, I got saved, I got the Spirit, I'm good to go the rest of my life. We need to be refilled. As you go through the book of Acts, it says, and being filled, Peter did this. Later on, and being filled, Peter did that. It's an ongoing filling, and the proof text is Ephesians 5.18. Very clear where Paul says, don't be drunk with wine, which is dissipation or wastefulness, but be filled with the Spirit. And in the Greek, it literally means be being filled with the Spirit. It's an ongoing filling. So this bush is on fire, but it's not being consumed or burned up. And by the way, this bush will talk. This bush knows Moses' name. And so Moses quickly realizes, this is not like any bush I've ever seen out here in the wilderness. So look at verse 3. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside... You might underline that phrase, turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And when, I, when you read that, do you think of, uh, you know, Charlton Heston and, you know, Yule Brenner and Moses, Moses. What does God sound like? I don't know. Whoever did his voice, I guess that's pretty close. So he said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Wow, what an amazing scene this is. When he sees the bush is not consumed, again, Moses turns aside because he wants to see, he wants to check out this great sight. Also notice, though, it says when God saw that Moses turned aside to look, that God began speaking to Moses. So here's an important question. Why is it that we don't hear from the Lord very often? The simplest answer is many times we don't turn aside. We just keep plowing right on through life. We just get busy doing life. We just grind ahead through another day. We get too busy, even in retirement, to slow down, turn aside, spend some quiet time just enjoying God, enjoying His Word, talking to the Lord about all the things going on in our lives. We live in a world that is full of distractions. I mean, th 20 years ago, we didn't have the distractions like we do today. I mean, everywhere we go, Elizabeth and I will be in a restaurant. We'll look at this family come in. They sit down, and every one of them, four or five of them, three or four kids sometimes, everyone's on a phone. It's like, you guys aren't even talking. I mean, they're just all looking at their phone, so distracted. How many times do you see people walking down the street, and they've just got their head in their phone constantly? There's God. He's calling out to us from the burning bush or a burning world a world that's in flames, and we don't even hear what he's saying to us because we're too busy doing life instead of spending time turning aside, listening to what God has to tell us. Notice the first thing God says to Moses once he's got his attention is, take off your sandals from your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. Here's another question. Where is 
your holy ground. In other words, where is God going to reveal himself to you? That's the holy ground. I've heard some people say, oh, I love coming to Calvary Chapel. This is where God meets me. This is where God speaks to me from his word. Well, that could be holy ground. Maybe it's when you're walking in the evening or the morning, and you're just talking to the Lord and speak, letting him speak to your heart. That's holy ground. Maybe it's just a room in your home. Maybe there's a certain chair you love to sit in because that's where you have your devotion. You just open up the word and let the Lord speak to you. That's holy ground. You know, it's just that time where you take off your shoes, you take off your sandals, you take off your boots. You kick back and you let the Lord speak to you from his word and you stop running around like Mike the Headless Chicken out in Fruta. You know, you sit at Jesus' feet and you let him minister to you from his word. It's like the scene in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus was visiting the home of Mary and Martha and we're told that Martha, or no, Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus listening to his words and she was just enjoying it. And then we hear Martha telling Jesus, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. And then it's in Luke 10, starting in verse 41, and Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're so worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. Now, don't think that serving is not important because serving is very, very important. James tells us, don't be hearers of the word only, but be doers of the word. You know, it's very important that we live out our Christian life, but the proper order of ministry must always be spend time with Jesus in his word, allow the Holy Spirit to encourage you and strengthen you, and only then go out and serve the Lord. Then you can serve the Lord with joy and gladness and not like, oh, here I go, serving God again. I hope you're watching God. I mean, that's not the right attitude. Otherwise, you'll be trying to serve the Lord in your own strength. And unlike this burning bush, you will become bushed as you burn out. And again, I've seen too many pastors over the years. They burn out after a few years because they're just putting ministry ahead of Jesus. The proper order is always... Seek first, right? Matthew 6, the very first verse I ever learned when I got saved. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. Or as Paul says in Philippians 2, verse 12 and 13, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He does not say work for your salvation. He says work it out. You've got salvation. You've got Jesus in you. Now let him out. You know, let the Lord work in you and through you. And then he even says, for it is God who works in you, both to will, he's the one that gives you that desire, and to do for his good pleasure. And so, the burning bush here. We also see this burning bush. It's a really good picture of the nation of Israel. You see that picture there? That's from uh, Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. That is a burning bush that they created, this sculpture, and it's perpetually burning because they know, man, we've been attacked. We've been, you know, consumed literally by fire in the ovens in Germany. You know, they've tried to destroy us, but we're still burning because they even recognize many Jews, that they're only burning brightly because God is faithful. And this is equally true for you and me today. Maybe some of your hopes and dreams have gone up in flames. Maybe your circumstances in life are contrary to what you thought was going to happen with your life. Maybe like Moses, you made mistakes and that took you out into the wilderness. Maybe the hope of some relationship that you desired to have never came about Maybe you've tried to serve the Lord, but it just didn't work out. So you're at the point of thinking, well, I guess I'm done. I give up. This is as good as my life is going to be. Let me leave you with, not leave you, we're not done. Well, close. Let me leave you with this verse, though. Never forget Romans eleven twenty nine. 29. This is so important. Very short little verse. It says, for the gifts and the calling of God are 
irrevocable. I love that word, irrevocable. Whatever he put on your heart, how he wanted you to serve him, maybe it was 10, 20, 30 years ago, it's irrevocable. He still wants to use you. He still wants to work in you and through you. You may think you're done, but as long as God keeps you alive, his plans for you have not changed. His love for you has never wavered. He still wants to bless you and use you for his glory. Look at verse 6. It says, Moreover, he said, so God says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. So this is the verse that Jesus quoted to the Sadducees. Remember when they were saying, oh, the resurrection, that's not even true. It's a joke. What if a guy marries you know, somebody and he dies and down the line he's married, she's married seven brothers. So who's, you know... Husband is she going to be, or whose wife will she be when she gets in? You know, it's just a bunch of nonsense. So Jesus says, you know, you are mistaken. You don't know what the scriptures are all about. And he says this in Matthew 22, verse 31. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, when he says, have you not read, the Sadducees only believed in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's the only five books of the Old Testament they even believed in. And so when he says, have you not read? Of course they read it, but they didn't understand it. Because concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. In other words, God is still their God. He said, I am their God. He didn't say, I was their God, but now they're dead and gone. No, he's still their God because they're, they're alive. At this point, they're in Abraham's bosom. So God is reminding Moses that he is not finished with his people. His covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it's still very real. It's still very valid. Verse 7, And the Lord said, I have surely seen... Oh, these are powerful words. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. This means it's going to be a very uh, productive land. To the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and all those other termites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt." But take note of verse 7 there. This is such a key here. And these are beautiful words, aren't they? God tells Moses, I have seen, I have heard, and I know. In other words, God is fully aware of what is happening to his people. The irony in this is they don't know that God sees and he hears. And they certainly don't know that God cares and that he's about to do something powerful in their midst. But that's often how it is with so many things that we face and we go through. We're in a dry place. We might be in a desert season of life. Life is hard, but God. But God sees, he hears, and he knows. And that's one of the awesome things we discover about God in the book of Exodus. All things do work together for good, to those who are called by God, to those who are loved by the Lord, to those who love the Lord, it'll work out if you keep your eyes on Him. God is always on the move, and He is working behind the scenes even when we can't see what and how and when He's going to do something. Maybe that's where you are today. You might be in pain physically. You may have a broken heart. You might be filled with fear and anxiety. You may be exhausted or you're weak and bruised because you've fallen, because of some bad choices you've made. Listen to God's voice right now as he says, I see, I hear, I know what you're going through. 
I'm fully aware of what you're facing. You may be saying, well, why this? Why now? But God wants to remind you that he's got this. He's got a plan that you can't even see right now. God knows the pain you're in, but God also knows the plan of delivering you from your situation. He knows your future. And never forget, here's an important thing to remember, God has information that we don't have. I hope you realize that. He's got a lot more information that you're, you're not even aware of. Jesus says it like this in John 16, verse 12. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. In other words, there's a lot more I'm going to share with you. I'm going to reveal to you. But right now, this is all you can handle. If I was to tell you what I'm going to do, you wouldn't even believe me. And that's what he'll do with the Jewish people as well. So by faith, we learn to trust the Lord. We learn to trust Him for our daily bread, right? The Lord's Prayer, our daily bread. Trust Him with all the unseen. Trust Him with all the unknown, all the stuff in your life you're not sure about. And so for Moses and the Jews, God is once again stepping into their situation in this world. And here He reminds Moses that his promises to the Jews of a promised land is about to take place. And for us as believers, we don't need to be led and controlled by our emotions because we know God loves us. That shouldn't be a feeling that comes and goes. You should just know because God is love. And let me just leave you with this one verse you're all familiar with, Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That can make you emotionally happy. It, it can not even be emotional because it doesn't have to be. That's the fact. God loves you. How do we know? He sent Jesus. He demonstrated his love by sending his only begotten son to die on the cross and shed his blood for your sins. That's all the proof you need. Does God really love me? Absolutely. Absolutely. Does he care what I'm going through? Absolutely. If you're his child, you've received Jesus by faith, then you belong to him. He's got a new covenant for you, and that new covenant is based on his blood. And he's demonstrated how much he loves you by dying in your place, taking the wrath upon himself, the wrath I deserve, that you deserve, when he hung on the cross and said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was forsaken in our place. And so we read in Hebrews 13, I will never leave you nor forsake you because you are his child. We're sons, we're daughters of God. Amen. Amen.